Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of Plan Produce Profit. Now, the XY team spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business. And what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you wanna work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, maximizing the benefits of technology to uh, run a, a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market how do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors, me 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recordings that I've done so far, the interviews, and uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So I hope you enjoy this series. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one stop easy-to-use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net, or visit financialexpress.net for more information. All right. Names. Nagel. Mr. Gali. Mr. Nash. Mr. Nagel. Mate, thank Mr. You. Nagel or Sir will be fine. <laughs> sir, my lord, my lord, is that all my lord, uh, as they would uh, get your throne fire. But mate, thank you for for joining us. Casual Friday today. Casual Friday today. On a Thursday for, for myself as well. Um, mate, uh, we're talking here all in this plan produce profit series on how to you know plan a compelling service proposition uh, produce, which is yep. what we're going to talk about today, growing scalably and in profit, which is get you. Uh, message to the masses, which we're going to jump into in a few weeks. But mm-hmm. uh, I know that uh, Tracer, you guys have got a, a pretty, pretty well, well-oiled machine there. So uh, keen to pick your brain on, on a few things um, uh, around efficiencies and and how you sort of squeezing the most juice out of uh, what you've got there, which is you know important when. There's, there's a limit on how much juice you've got to squeeze, right? Absolutely. Really, really important, my friend. <laughs> got to get the best out of your juice. <laughs> uh, hey, so a quick one. So uh, for anyone that, that doesn't know you, which uh, which wouldn't probably be too many, but um, so Tracer is a business? Yeah, Tracer's a business. Um, I, oh, look, it's, uh, we're actually, it's our 30th uh, anniversary this year. So business started back in 1989. Um, so yeah, we've uh, we've seen, or uh, well, the business has certainly seen a few iterations of the industry. That's a fact, uh, and I think the business itself is reflective of that. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, it's probably quite nice that the business has evolved. It you know it looks nothing like it did thirty years ago. It probably looks nothing <laughs> like it did ten years ago. Yeah. Um, so I've been uh, I've been with the business for twelve years of that thirty. So not quite fifty percent, but. Pretty close. That's pretty good. Long uh, as so, as yeah. have some of the you know the the team's pretty stable as well. So you know there's a few that have been in that sort of twelve to ten to twelve year uh, side of things as well. So yeah, I think that stability is kind of important, and you know maybe goes a little little bit towards efficiency mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like a lot of other businesses, I suppose I'm I'm pretty pleased that we dealt with. Uh, some of the sort of things that were going on in the Royal Commission, obviously that, you know, you needed to be blind Freddy not to notice uh, some of the things that were going to be coming up. So we'd sort of pre-planned for some of it. Um, so I think the business is uh, is in reasonable shape to sort of take the next set of challenges on. For sure. And so you guys have got how many advisors in track? So there are two parts to the business, which is one, there's a funds management arm. You guys are pretty closely linked with the implemented portfolios model. Yep. Uh, MBAs and yep. IMAs and all that sort of jazz. Yep. Uh, 
And but so for on the advisor side, how many advisors? Yeah, so on the advice, we actually uh, reshaped our team a little bit recently. Um, <laughs> lost to get lost to. Uh, so yeah, so I think it was quite it was quite interesting. So we were at three advisors, and uh, the support team as a ratio was liked, you know, by industry benchmarks. Yeah. Um, so we sort of um, probably touch a little bit more on business analysis, but we we spent some time looking at you know where we thought uh, we had some uh, funnels and blockages and those sorts of things, and we decided to essentially reduce our advisor numbers by one <laughs> and actually re-resource the support mechanism. So um, we are, I suppose, one down on the front line, but actually we've increased um, the backup troops. Right. Um, and we're just sort of working through that at the moment and um, doing some analysis around that to see what that's looking like. Yeah. But, what are you doing to control the ginger to non-ginger ratio in the business? Um, not very much at the moment. Um, <laughs> okay. we, I, I think we got that one about right, so not too, not too, uh, too many concerns around that. Right. So yes, that that uh, so you know actually um, I think the we you know stressing a business actually reveals its weaknesses pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and that's not always a bad way to sort of think about how you recruit, you know, because often mm. we think we know what we need uh, or we go to the obvious, um, but sometimes just allowing the business to stress a little bit and find out where the weak points are um, is a really good way to sort of say, right, actually, that's a bit where we need to, mm. to up our resources. I'm and sorry, that's what creates scale as well, right? Like mm. people talking on so having having good chat with, with Brett Evans the other day and, and talking about, you know, growth and growth is is uh, you know, is not necessarily gonna add to the to the bottom line. It's all just uh, just for show, but it's that it's that scalable piece making sure that the the difference in resources is driving a difference to the bottom line as well. Totally. Uh, absolutely, because you know, it's that that whole uh, you know your, your profit and your margins are where you need to be focused and you know sometimes you know one good client can replace 10 not so good clients Definitely. and and again yeah. you know that's a resourcing difference right it takes more than you know so you know you can increase client numbers via advisor numbers um, but that doesn't always add up to an improvement in the bottom line definitely and so in your business how many advised clients do you guys have uh, so we're about 450. Okay, and your client base, what's a typical client look like? Yeah, so a typical client are uh, usually sort of pre or post retiree. So that's sort of, um, I guess, at the moment, the business probably looks like that sort of 60 onwards age group um, with some coming through sort of, you know, 50s, but we're moving that demographic, we're sliding that demographic to the left. Um, so, you know, the 40 something is very important to our business now. Um, and I think our core service offering is somewhat reflective of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't remain pretty niche and pretty specialist around that pre and post retiree space. For sure. And what is the, what is the unique the service offer, the, the core service offer? So I think with the, with the core um, client base as it stands, that sort of pre and post retiree, um, really, we would. I, I would probably go back and say it's it's a product of that managed discretionary account service provided by Implemented, um, and the way that that runs and the way that allows us to interact with our clients in that space that tend to you know. So we're talking about sort of investor funds under advice in an ideal world for us, sort of that seven fifty to five million number. Mm -hmm. um, the investment serves that core really really well uh, and that enables us to drive a lot of scale into the business it also uh, to some extent provides us with the luxury um, to invest a little bit in the next generation and the next iteration of the business which will be that sort of you know what does the service offering need to look mm -hmm. like for 40 and 50 somethings um, and creating the space to evolve that is critical for the survival of the business over the long term and also it allows us to make sure that the business is modernising in terms of its advice model relative to the regulatory environment. Definitely. Yeah, and I think it's obviously we, um, 
you know, the, the broad that you you've got your core, but then the broader your space, you've got more uh, you know ability to to help more people. Um, but yeah, as we say that, I think that it's funny that the things that work for for one one age group, and we find this that they tend to work for a lot of other ones. I know that you guys do a lot of stuff. You're not financial advisors, you're financial life managers, and covering mm. all those bit, those bases, the coaching, the psychology, really got a tie ship on the, the investment side of things as well. But it's this, it, the, they're the same sorts of challenges, slightly different messaging, slightly yep. different uh, approach to the conversations. But ultimately, the, it's you don't end up if you've got a great offer for for one group, it's not going to be a million miles away from a from another group as well. Yeah, look, I think the uh, ultimately it all comes really back down to uh, well, there's a couple of areas. I suppose we've we've spent an inordinate amount of time recently around the whole um, process for knowing your client and developing ever better tools to make sure that you're really getting to the core of what the clients are, you know, what's important to them, mm. you know, what, what's, what, what are the areas, you know, we know that, um, you know, that uh, there, there have been examples of uh, through social media, elections have been potentially, you know, manipulated by pinging people about the things that really excite them or frustrate them and, you know, yeah. to some extent, you know, our business need, needs to sort of some, some be a microcosm of that. We've got to find out, you know, the areas that really concern our clients and then we've got to kind of build some value and, and a service around some of those things. So, you know, in the absence of a brilliant process, how are you going to tease that out? Uh, and then like historically, you know, we sit there with this sort of fact find which you probably, you know, you could do a pilot sample of, you know, probably 50 fact finds across the industry and then, you know, 49 will be rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's going back and then also sort of finding a way to um, deliver the fact find to a client in a better way as well. So, you know, what technology can you deploy um, which makes going through that process more acceptable and, and to some extent more stimulating and engaging for a client, right? So they're oh, kind yeah. of going, wow, this is cool. You know, yeah. they're, they're enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't create any barriers into your business. In fact, it's a really useful part of that onboarding process where yeah. clients are going, actually, this is this is good. This is interesting. I can see this is about me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like it's funny that you sometimes, like, I know that I've tested the waters, working with a couple of other potential referral, mm. you know, people that can help. We're always looking for good people to help our clients in yeah. areas of accounting and um, mortgage broken, that sort of stuff. And, yeah. Uh, a couple, a couple of times, had it where they'll send some like a PDF form out now, and it's just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, it's like you, uh, yep. one half of this information we have, and I two, know. why on earth would you oh, print this out and fill it in and yeah. sign it? It's like, oh my god, like, uh, no. So uh, it's pretty extraordinary because you know, you know, as a, you know, we spend a lot of time again as a team, sort of thinking, trying to put ourselves in the shoes of the consumer as opposed to, you know, members of the team within the business. And, you know, sort of every time we try and create either, you know, a, a process that we're putting our clients through, it's like, actually, if this was us, how would we feel about this? Yeah. You know, would we be kind of, you know, and you presented with the type of forms that you've just spoken about, you look at it and you just go, like, really? I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's not the greatest start to a business relationship when you kind of go, oh, geez, really? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, make it easy for me. How can you make this easy? Yeah. It needs to be yeah. compliant, but how can you make it easy? Or how can you, you know, how can you make it more engaging? How can it feel that what I'm doing is actually going to get a better result for me? Yeah, and reduce the friction, of course, as well, right? Yeah, friction, massive. Yeah, absolutely. But people people kind of are probably a bit more accepting of friction if they can understand that the end result is definitely going to benefit them. Yes. Uh, and, you know, sometimes in terms of the things that you're asking people, they kind of go, yeah, I kind of understand why I'm being asked this. I can see that this is going to get me a better outcome. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think that the user experience, and that's part of this, uh, yeah. this efficiency piece is a, is a big one uh, where we're all compared against the things that everything's amplified now where, you know, if you, yeah. if you, if you can't get it, someone set up with something in seven thumb strokes or, yeah. or less, but, you know, uh, then it's, it's difficult. So yeah. I think it's, it's uh, something that thankfully the technology enables, but it needs that, I think, the user experience first. Yeah. Approach. So, 
Look, I'm interested. You okay? So, like a dozen years in the business, pretty mm-hmm. significant amount of time. Uh, clearly, you guys have got so you got this pretty tight offer on the investment space. I yep. know you've done a lot of stuff with your processes, uh, CRM, that sort of stuff. But can you give us a bit of an overview on the journey in that in that dozen years or so of, of the business, in just in relation to efficiencies and how you approach things, how you figured out what to focus on. Uh, yeah, had a role from there. Yeah. I'll, I'll try. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot happened in twelve years. Uh, if you can remember. Uh, yeah, I, I think I can. The Alzheimer's <laughs> not not quite come on uh, too too far as yet. But um, I suppose um, the journey that we've had is is common for a lot of businesses that have been around over that period of time. Probably less common for some of the newer businesses. So you know, some of the businesses in within the XY community thankfully haven't had some of the frustrations of the past which is quite nice not to have those anchors um the the not so good part is that you, you don't know what can go wrong so the lessons are harder to learn because the mm. because you know you've not seen so much but um but certainly you know one of the things uh that we would have you know so 12 years ago you basically sitting inside of licensees um and that big licensee model is, you know, 12 years ago we were kind of kicking and screaming against it for all of the reasons that have just mm. been played out in front of the Australian population. Yeah. Were you guys with AXA or something? Uh, we were, oh, yeah, like which stuff. then something. fell into sort of genesis. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the great, uh, the great sadness of it all is that you know, from a delivery perspective, there were plenty of advisors around at that time that were sort of fighting against um, some of the practices that ultimately um, were revealed as still mm. endemic, you know, all, the, all that time down the track, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's a great sadness because, um, frankly, it could have been fixed much, much sooner mm. with much less distress. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, difficulties going on in the industry at the moment. And, um, you know, there's a lot of advisors really doing it tough. There's a lot of people leaving the industry. Um, and, you know, the advice community to some extent has to take a level of ownership for that. Mm. Um, and, um, but, the, you know, so there, was, there were not enough advisors at the time fighting against the licensees to get things changed. There were too many people taking checks, too many people that were compliant. The checks were too big. The checks were too big. <laughs> um, but where did it actually, you know, now you kind of, you, you would question the value of that. It was a big number at the time, but, you know, what does that yeah. do relative to a, what a modernised business might be worth now? So it's kind of interesting. Yes. Um, so the frustrations of a licensee, that, that environment which was driven by sales, um, driven by in-house product, driven by compliance. Yeah. None of those three features um, were anything to do with the client. Mm. All the while working within a fiduciary, I suppose, fiduciary environment, which is quite yeah. interesting. Um, so it's kind of no surprise that the industry sort of landed up where it did. So... Um, and with, with all that, the you know the fact that um, the licensees weren't compliant that, that they were compliance and sales centric, they weren't client centric, meant that the tech stack often imposed on businesses within those licensees yeah. was about primarily was about compliance, about protecting the license. Mm. Lowest common denominator True. business model, right? It means that even if you're a really great advisor, you are working to the rules of the worst advisor within a licensee. Yeah. Incredibly yeah. restrictive for somebody that's trying to think forward and develop and evolve um, when he's working in the in a in a rules based environment based on yeah. an advisor that's really probably has no business being in the industry mm. in yeah, the first place. Yeah, I've been chatting to our compliance consultant over the last uh, the last week, couple of weeks actually. We're just working on refining our fee disclosure statements and ongoing service agreements for right. clients and. Uh, it's actually ridiculous that we run this. We've got highly engaged clients, fixed fee only business. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our advice fee is like 5000 bucks. So when you've got someone paying you five grand, and especially a young person's paying mm. that out of their bank account, yep. they're, they're making sure that they're extracting that money, that value, it's or they're going to fire you, 
Right? Absolutely, so, yeah. Uh, I completely get that opt-in is important and the, the and all of the disclosure statements are important for that transparency. Yeah. But what I what I ended up doing is is saying because we do a six weekly phone call with all clients, but yeah. because I couldn't. Because I could, so with my service with my service agreement, I put a regular meeting, and then they're like, "Well, what's what's regular?" But then I can't put six weekly because then if I don't do it every six weeks, which sometimes because the client's travelling for two <laughs> months, yeah. so I can't do it. Yeah, totally. So so then I ended up just taking it out, and then now I say, "Okay, for five grand, I'm going to give you an annual review." But actually, what I'm going to give you is a six weekly <laughs> phone call. Is it that lowest common denominator? We see some stuff. There you are. There you are. And what sort of client experience is that when they get a thing and say? Five thousand bucks, you get an annual review. Yeah. Oh, look, down, mate, the world is upside down, and you know, you know, I absolutely echo your frustration. The problem is, of course, that regulation is a laggard. Yeah. It has to be by definition. It's a laggard. You know, it's fixing things up often, right? So, yeah. um, and the, the the great shame is that you know, still the advisors and businesses like yours, and you know, the the work that we're trying to do within Tracer, this new stuff. Mm-hmm really isn't necessarily for the client's benefit, as you've just explained. You know, it's it's really, again, to go back to stop people doing the wrong thing and, ticking you know, the box, ticking yeah. the box stuff and lowest common denominator. It's a great shame, but it's what it is. Yeah. Right? It's what it is and uh, we have to work with it and, uh, and we have to work with our clients to help them understand, you know, not only the regulatory framework, but actually trying to work through some of the problems that you've just described. Yeah, well, I can have to have this conversation with all the people now and say, hey, yeah. this is what it says, this is why it says that. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, what you yeah. get. But, sorry, yes, I yeah. interrupted. So no, the, you're the, right. The so, technology confines yeah. of, the, of the internal model. I, yeah. yeah, so we were being, you know, we had, uh, so there were technology platforms that were delivered by the licensee that were calibrated to protect the licensee and not really... It wasn't, you know, the software wasn't designed to create client engagement, better client experiences. Uh, it wasn't created even to support great service, actually. <laughs> um, so we kind of, uh, you know, we're sort of moving on through the, the 12 years now, but we uh, we ultimately freed ourselves um, of that licensee. And then when we actually um, went, and went out and got our own license, which is something that I'd always advocated for because 18 years ago when I arrived... Uh, into Australia and mm. moved into financial services and financial advice for the first time, I looked at the framework and I could not understand yeah. the concept of this licensing regime. So I rather naively, and it's the only reason that we did it, by the way, we rather naively immediately got our own license. And the only, we did that because I had no reference points on anything that was, which is, you know, it's too hard, it's too expensive and it's hard to maintain. <laughs> You know, this was an absolute illusion that was popped out there by probably yeah. big licensees, right? Yeah. So, um, so I was really grateful, you know, to be able to, to sort of take Tracer through that process. Um, that enabled, that freed us up. So we essentially kicked out a piece of software, which probably a lot of the advice community use, still use. Um, what we wanted to do was to put a piece of software into the business that essentially was client-centric, um, we we chose we wanted that to be the CRM. Essentially, that's the bit that talks to your clients yeah. right, in an ideal world. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to put that at the centre of our business. You know, we happened to choose Salesforce, um, and then like a, I suppose, um, you know, when we did that, it was quite a radical leap. You know, there really wasn't. Uh, there wasn't a lot of Salesforce users in the in the industry at the time. Certainly not for a practice the size of the Tracer business. Um, you know, we had to bolt other bits on because obviously Salesforce mm. couldn't write an SOA and you know sort of things like that. But we were prepared to do that because, as far as we were concerned, how we produce an SOA doesn't really impact the client as long as they end up with a good document. Yeah, um, it doesn't matter, right? So yeah. we didn't need a big clunky piece of software that was there really to produce this document. Mm. You know, we wanted to have the client experience at the at the, at the fore. Um, you know, the problem is with Salesforce is that it's a big beast. You know, you take it out of the box and it's sort of, wow, that's nice. Look at yeah. all the things it can do. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> and then you start to write checks to, to obviously to make it fit the business. And, uh, you know, and I think that uh, like any other, you know, we've been on a journey with Salesforce. Um, we, we actually um, got to a point, I think, where that it really is, it, it, it sort of does 
uh, it runs our business now. Um, and we're just, um, we're now on the next evolution of our Salesforce journey. Um, and we've partnered with a business called Wealth Connect. Um, and I think for the first time in my experience, uh, we seem to have a tech provider that looks to be able to deliver all of the things that we want within the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, and we're just working through that process at the moment. So we've just upgraded to Salesforce FSC and uh, Financial Services Cloud, and um, we'll now have Wealth Connect build, build the ecosystem within that environment. Um, which will include SLA production and all those. So for, so for the first time, we're really going to have um, the entire business run within that Salesforce environment. Pretty exciting stuff. Mm. But, you know, like anything else, we're, we're sort of waiting for the, <laughs> we're waiting yeah. for the delivery of it. Yes. But it's a, it is a very significant component of what we seek to do next. Right. So what is Wealth Connect? So because so your Salesforce is running, you know, your processes, tasks, your day to day stuff, yep. run snapshots, all that jazz already. What does the Wealth Connect give you that the? Oh, well, actually, Wealth Connect comes with that infrastructure. So there's you know there's workflow in there. There's a whole bunch of you know the Salesforce Financial Services Cloud was never truly Australianized. It, you know, it came out of the US. It's still yeah. out of the box. It still looks quite US centric. So yeah. um, so it's kind of been Australianized. The processes and procedures for an Australian practice are now embedded within that app, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so it's much more off-the-shelf solution. Uh -huh. um, and then, you know, and clearly the ability to not necessarily require any sort of um, third-party providers outside of that to produce other documents is mm -hmm. obviously you start to like you start to pull your infrastructure back to, yeah. to that single um, space, which is really, you know, it's exciting, like I said, you know, it's uh, we're, we're working on this stuff. It's mm. work in progress. Um, it's not delivered yet. It's not working yet. So it's all, it, but it looks it looks amazing yeah. so far. I find that it's CRM. So we've been on this journey, Salesforce based as well for uh, I think coming up to three years mm. at the end of this year, and it's uh, it's a it's a forever project. Like I think we we follow a <coughs> business planning and management methodology similar to like the rock habits or yeah. the traction tools or that sort of stuff where you've got your key priorities for the 12 months, break them down into rocks or your four months, sprints, whatever. Yeah. And uh, it's just an always rock is like what's the next step with yeah. the with the CRM? Like yeah. how can we how can we drive a bit more efficiency? How can we make the reporting better for our internal staff? How to make it easier for us to work together as well. So I think that the, if you want to, you know, obviously we're talking all about efficiency in this series that that's sort of the core. Like, I don't see how you can run it, run an efficient operation without having some sort of, uh, some sort of, yeah, a, 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 focus, a, a consistent focus on, uh, on, on doing that as well. And yeah. I think that say, the, the joy of Salesforce is the beauty and the curse is that you can do everything, mm. um, but it's, you know, it's sort of future proof. And I know that even a lot of the guys that run some of these advice tools, businesses that they say, it's hard for them to do great financial modeling and uh, document production and workflow management and uh, BS, BS CRM as well. Mm. Uh, it's, it's sort of hard that you get the, the best of breed, that extra 10% that you get from using the best tech in each of this, in each part of your stack. Yeah. You end up getting a much, you know, a, an exponential sort of uptick in your mm. output. Totally. You, you know, the... The other you mentioned it uh, before, you know, when you're sort of putting your um, fee for service agreements together and being very careful that you're delivering on everything that you promise. You know, how do you create a great document um, without, you know, potentially over promising and under delivering, as you say, not necessarily in an intentional way, but you know, there can there can be there can so if you under promise always, you're you're in safe space. Um, but I think that um, you know you, the um, technology can help it has to support the client experience yeah. um, because you know they're getting ever greater technology from banks um, you know there are our life is now surrounded with technology that makes things easier mm. um, and you know our industry has probably struggled and hasn't really kept up with that so you know the what Salesforce has of course is the ability to create fantastic client portals you can create a wonderful two-way mirror into your business from a client perspective 
Um, you know, and I'm looking forward. We've we've not been able to achieve that thus far, and I'm looking forward to us being able to deliver that in the course mm-hmm. of the next 12 months. Um, because you know, clients have an expectation to be able to see information very quickly and readily, and more importantly, in a format that they select. Yeah. Right? So it's really not for us anymore to decide what our clients want to see or what they can or can't see. It's, yeah. you know, because one client will really want to see something completely different from another. Mm. And you've got to have an ecosystem that supports both. Sure. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what we're working, working really intensely at the moment in, in trying to determine what that looks like. Um, You know, this isn't something that we're going to be able to do in the next month, the next two months, but I certainly think within the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to be seriously advanced in terms of creating uh, almost like a widget-based ecosystem where our clients can select what they see. So let's let's take a a step back for a second. Think about when you guys went and, and perhaps the focus has always been there on efficiency, but when you started jumping right into the efficiency side of things, um, how do you figure out where to start? That's a common uh, a common thing that I that I hear from people. How do you prioritize? Uh, well, we we sort of prioritize based on um, creating scale within the business. Mm-hmm. Um, so we really, you know, it, you can see pretty quickly within your business where you run out of space quite quickly. Um, and you've just got to avoid it because if you do, you know that your capacity is limited and res- significantly restricted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I guess the obvious example is if you're if you're trying to run model portfolios without a discretionary mandate, your ability to service 5, 10, 15, 20 clients really well is probably okay, but you start yeah. to get 40 to 60 and, you know, the, the um, potential for error, uh, or treating clients differently, mm. you know, client A gets a completely different outcome to client B yeah, yeah. because you spent more time looking at client A's portfolio mm. um, or he asked more questions that you reacted to. Yeah. You know, none of that made sense. Uh, and also you just get you get completely bogged down. Um, mm. So, you know, running portfolios that have flexibility, the ability to customise, you know, a discretionary mandate running across them, which means on a day-to-day basis, the advisor doesn't need to be involved in that. It's being taken care of. The advisor needs to be brilliant at communicating the service, which is really important. Mm. Um, But that's really, that frees up a lot of time when you are not burning energy researching a whole bunch of different managed funds or... Mm. you know, stocks or whatever it might be. Yeah. If you take away that burn of energy, which has very low value to the end client, um, and you trust yourself as an advisor to move beyond that, um, then you will create capacity. That's That was our example. And yeah. there'll be other practices that have different examples. You know, they mm. might be desperately trying to run budgeting as yeah. an example for their clients right now. Um, working with a client at that very granular level mm. is labour intensive, yeah. even with some technolo- technological support. So you yeah. have to think to yourself as a business, how many how many clients can we service without dropping standards? Mm. Um, and yeah, how- I think that's a big one for the team as well, right? Yeah, and massively. You, like, yeah, yeah you, want to, you want to be efficient as an advisor and make it so that you're giving a consistent client experience and you can access the information that you need to deliver the service that you yeah. want. But one of the things that I've noticed is you bring more, as your team grows, you bring more people into the business. If the people aren't there from the start, it happens they don't know every client and they don't yeah. know, well, they don't know every client in detail because they haven't worked with them since the very start. Yeah. It's even more important that you yeah. have that, that information totally. readily available, easily accessible. Even things that we had, uh, we got Chloe, she started uh, three months ago or two months ago or something, just a preferred name. And she's then she's spinning the wheels trying to go, who is Tommy? There's no Tommy. There's <laughs> no right. Tommy on the right. on the list, and who's yeah. all of it? Oh, yeah. it's that. Yeah, and it's a different name. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think again, you know, that's that's obviously technology, and you know, Salesforce is a is is an example of something that obviously can assist with that. Um, but you have got to get it cranking. You have got to get it calibrated to your business mm. model, whatever whatever that is. And you've got to you know you've got to make some decisions around. You know, and I think it's fairly, I think it's a relatively straightforward process to understand where you run out of road. 
Uh, and if you think you're going to run out of road, you've got to rethink your strategy or you have to constrain your business to be what it is. Yeah. So if you're comfortable um, servicing 100 clients and you know you can do it beautifully and it generates enough revenue for you, that's cool. That's yeah. totally fine. Yeah. Um, but if your ambition is beyond that, then you have to think about how you're going to scale mm-hmm. that business up. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think uh, we, we met a, uh, and I think there are ways of doing this, right? We met a, a really interesting um, lady when we were last over in San Francisco and her, she was really a money coach. Mm-hmm. And that's all she, she put herself up as a money coach and mm-hmm. she was really about spending intensive amounts of time with people mm-hmm. around budgeting, cash flow, the really granular stuff. Yeah. Um, but she would work with them for a period of probably three to six months. Okay. And then she'd be gone out of their lives because the work was done. It was, you know, that whole, you know, if you want to feed a man, teach him to fish, you know, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just don't pop down to fish and chip shops, yeah. last for half an hour, right? And then you're done. Yeah. So it's a little bit like that. So she kind of goes in, gives the clients the tools. And I, I just sort of thought to myself, you know, that's a really interesting way for a business to think about scale. So they could, you know, they can pull in somebody like that into their business to work with their clients mm. intensively for three to six months. Yeah. Um, and then she kind of lets them go. And you've now got this beautifully trained client mm. around budgeting and cash flow and financial behavior. And you carry on doing your work. And you've not, you know, you've not tried to do that bit yourself. Yeah. Um, because actually that's really difficult. That's really tough to scale. So there, you've really got to think through your bottlenecks. Yeah, um, and break right. out the bottleneck rules. Have you? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's uh, that that approach that they I can't remember off the top of the head, but it, but where it's like to identify the, the issues that are the issues and the capacity thing. Or yeah, totally. Thing, yeah, uh, and then refining and, and tweaking it. So it's, yeah. a, it's a very effective process in in identifying stuff, and you can you can create a, you know we self we. Because we don't have the back end capacity, you put your own bottlenecks in, and, and that's that's an okay <laughs> that's to do it. sometimes. Yeah. But as right. long as you know where it is. Right? Yeah, and and that's right. You know, and like I said, not you know, um, scale is something that's important to businesses that seek to grow to a particular size. Mm. You know, if uh, but up there are businesses that remain small yeah. and. You know, they do very well and they satisfy the requirements of the business owner and that's great. You know, yeah. There's totally nothing wrong with that. So uh, so I think that one of the first things you've got to do is kind of understand what, what do you want, you know, what are you in right. business for, what's the, you know, what's the balance that you're trying to achieve with life and, um, you know, if you can do a brilliant job for a, a, for a particular uh, business model, number of clients, revenue, that's fine. Then that's go, for, go for go for scale it. for your time. You can spend more time on the beach. Then you start no. to scale for your time. Bang on. Same with the same amount of time. Bang yeah. on. Then you start to scale for your time. Absolutely. Yeah. And all you've got then really is this sort of renewal process to make sure that you're mm. you remain current with what you're doing and that your you know your advice models are modernised and those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but for those with bigger ambitions or for those with more mature, larger businesses like the Tracer business. You know, we have to think about scale. Mm. Our, our business is built for sort of generation, you know, 30 years in, the business is built for generational survival. It's built for, you know, having members of the team that can evolve into business owners or part business owners themselves mm. down the track. It's a different model to to sort of a one or two man band that might be more comfortable with a, with a smaller ambition. So for us, it's important because we need to, and, and you know, the next phase of that, or phase of that for us at the moment and, you uh, something that I would urge everybody to do is to is to analyze their business. You know, yeah. really spend some time on business analytics. Uh, and we've spent some time, you know, sort of having a look at the partitions within our business, at, you know, fee rates, time spent on particular clients, those sorts mm-hmm. of things. Work out, you know, work out what area of your business is generating the best revenue relative to the yeah. time that you're spending, um, work out the parts of your business that are generating great client outcomes where you're getting lots of stickability and mm-hmm. compliments around what you're doing, work out, the, you know, and one of the great things for some businesses that are that are having to let grandfathered revenue go, that's an opportunity. Yeah. You know, you're going to have a bit, bit of space. Yeah. Freed up by, you know, maybe, you know, you, one, one might argue that there was not a lot of servicing going on to those clients in some businesses. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, that's gone. 
Uh, so you can you can sit there and you can be frustrated about that, or you can say, right, what are we going to do? How are we going to replace that? Yeah. Um, you know, some businesses might be running around trying to sign those clients up for sort of engaged agreements yeah. going yeah. forward. Mm-hmm. Um, others might take a view that, you know, switch it off and move on. Um, so, again, that's up to the individual business owners to sort of think through. But yeah. one way to... You know, I think you've really got to analyse what what your business is great at and where the opportunities lie going forward before you decide, particularly on strategy. Yeah, and like for my my personal view, one I'm, I'm anti grandfathering, but um, it, but mainly because of the, the I see the predominance of no service yeah, issues. Totally, in that, uh, totally agree with people, you. People are doing it right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but for me, I've always found that it's easy to just go and get a new client instead of trying to convince an existing client to change their mindset. I had the same thing with the previous business that I was in where we start, when I started out, I had very limited idea how to, how to really add value to younger people. So we were mm. doing a pretty basic model where it was like uh, super insurance, charge a percent, and yeah. you know, off you go. And it wasn't that they weren't highly engaged people. And then I spent all this time creating a model, starting this journey that I'm the one that I'm on today, mm. and came up with a service offering that I thought was quite cool. And then I'm going, to people, hey guys, guess what? I figured out how to do this thing. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, here you go. What do you think? And they're like, oh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I can stick with uh, that. So or they would, or they would change, and then they would opt out because yeah. got, it wasn't what you know for what they wanted the thing that they bought in the first place. And yeah, you know, that's a that's the thing as well. So um, yeah, I think it's it, it, it's an interesting one. So tell me with your with when you're looking at the analytics and seeing where's profitable because I think that's a really really important part of efficiency. Yeah. efficiency that a lot of people overlook. You know, it's easy to look and go oh, well, let's automate this document and let's do this thing, build a tech stack and do this other thing and use yeah. it to app and connect some stuff and, you know, happy days, I'm efficient. But yeah. looking and going, well, where's the profitable segment of my business? Where's yeah. the right place for me to be spending my marketing, attention, time, money, potentially, whatever, uh, is a big part of it. So how is that enabled by the CRM or how, how did you actually tackle that analysis? Um well, to, to be honest, it, it was it could and should at some point and going forward, um, part of the of the rebuild inside of Salesforce is to strengthen the business analytics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, spreadsheets. Yeah, you know, spend some time. Like, you know, right. like except, I, 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 except it's inefficient. Like I hate it. It's inefficient. <laughs> I hate it, and uh, and it's not immediately reportable and it's not immediately renewable. But for, for us, it was sort of a one-off project that we yeah. were looking at, so it's yeah. kind of it's okay. Yeah. Uh, and we absolutely um, recognise that we need to strengthen our ongoing business analytics within Salesforce. Yeah. Um, but we'll build it around the model, which is essentially, you know, where's the, you know, what are we really great at? Where are we really... Um, where are we doing well in terms of satisfying client objectives, meeting their needs and all those sorts of things... Um, what do our margins look like in that space? And and then what are we, how are we allocating the business resources to serving that bit? Yeah. And what you often find, you know, it's classic, you know, it's 80-20 rule, you know, mm. is, is often the case. And most businesses that do the analytics, they'll, they'll come across it. And then, yeah. you know, far often it's kind of, go, oh, well, yeah, 80-20, that's what people talk about. It's happening to us as well. And it's yeah. like you kind of move on. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, it's, so it's doing something about it. And it's kind of recalibrating yeah. everything. Yeah. within the business to sort of say, well, actually, these guys are, you know, there's there's some profit over here, there's less profit over here, but, geez, that's because we're taking way too much time over here. Yeah. We need to kind of move some resources from that part and move them across here. Yeah. Um, and, of course, what you're doing then, you're spending most of your time with the clients that are more profitable and more fitting to the business. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and I think that... We often in business we land up, you know, not being able to see the wood from the trees, and suddenly you're servicing, you know, all of the clients to the best of your ability, and you forget actually that you need to dive in and make sure that the clients are suited to the business, suited to the future of the business, um, and making sure that, you know, when you do onboard clients, that they absolutely fit your model. Absolutely. And having the confidence in your strategy yeah. to tell clients that don't fit your model to either go to a different practice or, um, or you know, you might um, sort of point so them in a different... Send them to Adrian Paddy. We could. We, we, that's right. So yeah, that's probably a good place to, 
Ten is uh, yeah, I think Paddy would be the perfect place to start. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Mate, so tell me, what, where do you reckon people go wrong when it comes to efficiency? Uh, oh, look, I think that the, often it's a case of commercial pressure resulting in bad decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of really easy, isn't it, for businesses to sort of say, right, we're going to have clients that generate X dollars a year, da -da 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 -da, and if we get 20 of them, our business is going to be fantastic. And, of course, the, the, you know, on a spreadsheet looks wonderful and then, yeah. you know, sort of six months down the line, the, you know, you're paying your WeWork rent or whatever it might be and it's like, geez, you know, I, I thought we'd have 20 of those clients by now. We've only got five. And then you start to, you, start to, you know, you have, to, you have to either invest for longer to yeah. carry on your strategic pathway. Um, you have to make sure that your strategy is right and be confident in it. Or you start diving on your sword and saying, oh, geez, I better take a client that is not quite like the one that I want. But, yeah. You know, there's some revenue there, so that's that's helpful and it'll help us pay the bills. And I think that, you know, often commercial reality gets in the way of good strategy. So you're saying that the, the thing is stick to your stick to your model because then that then allows you to be more efficient because it's your model. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I like it. I like it. Um, Brett Evans came up with an interesting one when when we were chatting as well, which is all around making sure that you've got your foundations and your processes uh, correct. But I think that that's uh, yeah, it, it's definitely something I know that for, for me in that doing that consistent. Day in, day out, do the same. We don't do insurance only advice. We mm. don't do super only advice. We mm. don't do cash flow only advice. We do <laughs> we do our advice and that's yep. it. And that's you want to buy it? Great. I've got four processes in my business that I use, yep. which is my prospect process, my onboarding process, my ongoing client process, and my annual review process. Yep. That's it. That's my whole business right yep. there. And because I'm not doing like, look, yeah, I've got a couple of clients with self managed super fund, but because I'm not doing, yeah. you know, a super self managed super fund one day and a super complicated other yeah. thing the other day, it allows me to just go, yeah, okay, let, and let's, um, and I suppose it actually talks to, to Freddie's point as well that it's, it allows you to come that constant focus, improvement, refinement, efficiency, yep. um, and not getting too distracted as well. So uh, it's, it's, com it's complexity and distraction that will get you every time. You know, um, and uh, you know that's again one of the one of the positives of, of sort of um, mature businesses losing potentially sort of grandfathered revenue or grandfathered clients. One of the advantages of that is that you will reduce complexity within the business mm. um, without a doubt. Emails so, and phone calls and stuff as well. Yeah, totally. So you know, you, you there's there's a you know often of, you know business owners are reluctant to let revenue go. Mm. And, and you know, you need to sometimes, you know, someone forces that issue and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah so, 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 like, so, totally. And then, yeah. you, you know, you have, a, you have the ability to regenerate. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, there's, there's uh, businesses that do regenerate will come out of it much more strongly there you know there'll be you know the future of the industry will be brighter because of it mm -hmm. even though right now it seems pretty painful and it feel, feels like what well, it has you know the industry's been under attack has it probably gone too far well maybe mm -hmm. who knows um you know one of the, the 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 side effects is you know cost to serve obviously has increased which means that people mm -hmm. fall out of advice uh, which is which is somewhat of a shame. Um, the banks will probably come back into that space at some point, yeah. direct to consumer offerings. Yeah. Yeah. AMP, yeah. we're talking about yeah, this exactly. yesterday, yeah. right? So yeah. I think that Digital that stuff, totally right. Because the other unfortunate thing, I, as I see it, is that we're, we're charging more. It's okay for me, and, yeah. and I've had this criticism uh, from a few people before. That I go, you know, we're charging five grand, okay. One working with people that can pay it, no yeah. worries. For me, it's no problem. Yeah. Um, but it means that there are people that would, they just you just have to cut them out of a model like that because mm. it can't it can't be sustained. So mm. uh, I think that, but that's where I think the technology that definitely can yeah. uh, can can fill the gap. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the difficulties though, Ben, will be you know you, you're going to be competing with um, you know I don't know how much are AMP raising. Six hundred and fifty. Three hundred. I thought it was three hundred, but yeah. I can't, I can't remember. But the, whatever, lot. big number, right? Yes. 
Um, so, you know, the, a lot of that money, as I've said, you know, is going to go back into, you know, technology and creating direct-to-consumer offerings. So, you know, if you're a standalone practice, you've got to sort of think about, mm. uh, I'm not saying you can't compete with that, you've got to think about how you're going to do it, right? So, Although that being said, a &B did spend $100 million in planning sales force in their business, and I've heard that it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty limited in terms of what it can actually, actually <laughs> do. <laughs> Still, maybe uh, that $300 million spent yeah. still holds out some hope for us. Yeah, ma so well, well, <laughs> well <laughs> maybe. Money doesn't always solve the problem. There's plenty of examples where it hasn't but you know i guess what I'm, what I'm saying is you know that obviously the big financial institutions got a lot of financial muscle in terms of building yeah. technology which um, which isn't cheap but you know i've you know one of the great vibrancies within the xy community is the ability of people to share information you know they're using mm. free plugins and they're getting yeah. stuff to work you know yeah. and uh, and that's awesome so mm. you just got to find out um, you know if you're going to compete at that sort of more um, uh, at, the, at the sort of budget advice level, mm. um, you know, you, you've got to be aware that you're up against the industry funds and you're up against mm. the big institutions and you've got to find your niche and you've got to find a, a way um, to have a great delivery mechanism around that. Yeah. Not impossible and, and there'll be people that make a lot of money doing it. So, you know, um, yeah. but I think generally there will be a, you know, whilst we're losing huge numbers of advisors within the industry at the moment, um, will probably land up with more competition. Yeah, and I think it has to link to people to trust more in mm. advice when there's not the, you know, they're paying 3% admin fee for yeah. their shitty old soup fund and they're wondering why it's never going up. Yeah, like, that's right, yeah. Uh, when that sort of stuff goes and everything's half percent, totally, yeah. then people go, yeah. oh, actually, soup's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, totally. It's like, wow, my balance is growing. What happened? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mate, that's great. So tell me, if, if you guys were to go back to the drawing board mm. uh, and, and start from scratch, what would you have done differently from, from the emulation group? Um, that's a, re it's a really difficult question to answer. I, I, I guess um, what, I pro <laughs> what I probably, uh, I think that um, it goes back to the point that I raised before, which is, now, if you've got a if you've got a strategy and you've got a model that you believe in, um, I think you have to really have the confidence to go through and discharge on that. Mm -hmm. And if it's not working, change your strategy. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, keep to your strategy. Yeah. Don't have a strategy and then kind of go, oh, well, we'll kind of do that on the side a little bit, yeah. and uh, we'll sort of we'll keep this strategy. But if you know, we'll yeah. we'll sort of you know fill in the gaps with this other yeah. stuff. Um. And I think that probably, yeah, if I if I sort of rewound five years, I'd probably say, right, I'm going to be a bit more purist around the approach mm -hmm. um, because where we've remained, uh, you know, I think where we've tried to do that, we've had our greatest successes. So, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, you're, you have a purist business model uh, and it's been nice that you can, you, you know, you've created that from the beginning pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Um, and you've run with it and you've stuck with it and it's mm. delivering results. And I think that, um, you know, the lesson, uh, diff more difficult for a business like Trace that's 30 years old and, yeah. you know, it's kind yeah. of been, you know, yeah, it's had yeah. its different iterations. But, um, you know, but I think, um, you know, certainly if, if you can look forward to having a model that you or and a strategy that you stick to and you're really confident, you know that you're great at what you do, uh, you service clients, you deliver value for money, all that stuff. <laughs> um, you've got to be in good shape, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that the – so, yeah, I would say uh, if there's anything I would have changed, it would probably have been, you know, sort of running along with a more purist yeah. uh, version of what we were doing because where we remain true to ourselves, we definitely got the best results. Mm, awesome. Love it. Focus. Focus is always good. Totally. Um, cool, mate. Well, look, I'm, I know we could, we could talk about this all day, but uh, a few quick ones for you before sure. we go. Biggest, uh, biggest oops moment or, or stuff up on the journey? Uh, biggest oops moment was probably when we, uh, when we threw a piece of software out to make room for Salesforce and then started to think about how we were going to produce SLIs. <laughs> sort of an important thing. Yeah. Well, look, it was kind of you know we we, we sort of uh, you know we kind of got away with it. We're not a high volume business. We don't you know we don't sort of don't particularly want to be. But yeah. um, 
yeah, it was kind of, uh, but actually it was quite cathartic because you have to go back and sort of go, okay, blank sheet of paper, yeah, write really good documents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, uh, I think it was probably uh, early on in the piece, um, the guy that I originally started to, to work with, which, you know, was, was about when you create a document or, you know, it doesn't matter, a modernised version of that might be a slide deck or whatever, like just make it really fantastic for a client to read. Mm -hmm. Get your numbers consistent, you know. Don't have stuff jumping around like, yeah. where did that number come from? Yeah. And then you're there scratching your head. I'm not really sure. So just yeah. great consistent documents. It's, that's stayed with me. Yeah, love it. Good. And also good user experience to what we are talking about before. Totally. Cool. Uh, top tip for teams? Top tip for teams. Like team help, you know, working with the team, managing yeah. the team. Um, look, I think... Uh, creating a collective sense and um, of, of where you're going and what you're trying to achieve, um, making sure that everybody's on the journey, everybody understands why you're on the journey and everybody believes in the journey. I think that's awesome. If you can all, we, we're actually, uh, at the moment, we're kind of doing some work around that actually just to try and make sure that everybody knows what we're doing and why we're doing it yeah and and just basically getting people's uh people excited about what we're trying to achieve right? yeah yeah i think that's super important that's actually we're doing a similar thing at the moment as well and it's easy that you've got parts of the business where you're sort of toiling away that sometimes it's like the forest of the trees sort of thing you know? and that's totally super powerful when everybody is when they have that alignment yeah i'm in production but hi i know i know why these things are being done this way I know why Mark's pedantic yeah. about the numbers not jumping in from everywhere. Like I understand that this, did, this delivers better client results. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And last one, uh, what's your spirit animal? Oh, spirit animal, tortoise. Tortoise. <laughs> Just to random it up a bit. <laughs> I expected something there. There you go. <laughs> Well, just, I'll leave you to do the psychological unraveling yeah. of that. <laughs> mate, thank you very much. For uh, mate, it's been a pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Yeah, good stuff. Good on you, mate. Well done.